Hello everyone, welcome to the database seminar on uh, blockchain. So today it's my great pleasure to introduce a, um, uh, a, an invited speaker, Sophia Wang from Uber, and she will talk about uh, scalability issues in blockchain. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, so today I'll continue the discussions last week uh, to talk about more advan uh, advances in scaling blockchains. So scalability is really a big issue for, for blockchains today. So for example, the Crypt CryptoKitties released last year actually DDoSed Eth Ethereum. Uh, so what, what, what does this mean? It's pretty much like blockchain today is like a lot of years ago, like where we first got into telecommunication. It's, it's pretty much like this. But uh, in order to, for blockchain to be widely used as much as internet or telecommunication, we need a much, much, much higher scale blockchain. So to realize that, uh, the Ethereum fu founders actually tries to, uh, uh, to award some grant to solutions for to solve the scalability issue. So what we hope is that after all the scalability solutions are live, what we can achieve is like we can have like 3G, 4G, or 5G counterpart on blockchain. So, but there is still a long way to go. So what is scalability? To define scalability, we can actually use a very simple metric that is the number of transactions per second. So this is pretty much like the throughput metric we define on, uh, on a lot of like, on a lot of systems. So, how is the throughput calculated? So uh, we can consider like three parameters. One is the level of concurrency. The other is block size, which means the number of transactions put into a block. And another is the time to generate a block. So on Bitcoin today, like the, the block generation interval is about like 10 minutes. So on some other blockchains, it's much, much smaller. Like for EOS, it's claimed to be like three seconds, but for, uh, for Ethereum, it's also like more than like 10 seconds-ish. So there are a bunch of work built around improving the factors uh, that can affect the throughput. So one is about block size. Uh, it means like some people tries to propose that we can just increase the number of transactions into one block. So some work is like uh, people submitted diffs to Bitcoin like to just increase the block block size from one megabyte to uh, like ten or like seven. And also there are some like uh, Bitcoin improve improvement uh, program that proposes something like SegWit, which is like removing the hash from the block size so that you can actually put, put more into the, into, the, into the block. So there are also, there are also a few work on uh, improving the block generation interval. So mostly around the consensus algorithms. Um, that is like proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, or um, Byzantine fault tolerance. So uh, I think we have covered this uh, in the last week. So there is another factor that is le level of concurrency. So this is pretty much like, uh, pretty much like uh, what we do in the normal like cloud. So there is no way that a node can know everything uh, of the blockchain. So what people usually do is like you have to shard, the, shard all the transaction data or any data into multiple nodes so that a node just know some portion of all the data. So. Let's take a look at, for each vector, like in details, what people do. So for increasing the block size, there are many proposals. But uh, so what the benefit is, like one, on, one, on one side, the benefit is like it can increase, increase the scalability. On the other side, it can also lower the cost. But there are a lot of discussions around like the drawback of increasing block size with the major concern of it could damage decentralization. So 
imagine like a host uh, or like a node which actually managed to uh, mine the to mine the the hash, but uh, the ho uh, the node is actually a, a adversary uh, which which put like a lot of transactions which can be not so good or bad. Like so so if if the node if the node is hashed like it can it can immediately like dump a lot of transactions onto the onto the blockchain. So some people consider this to be bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, if this is sort of constrained by the common bandwidth of each mining mining node they have. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean the actual bandwidth of? Yeah, because for mm -hmm. example, if the uh, if the time interval of each Bitcoin blockchain is ten minutes, mm -hmm. then it seems that the largest block size you can possibly set is uh, whatever bandwidth you have the, or the most mining nodes have uh, times yeah. of ten times in interval, right? So yeah, I think that makes sense. I think they are what they are talking about is like whether you should set an additional limit to limit that or not. So, but that is the actual actual block size you can one can achieve. So you can never go faster than the actual network. Okay, so. Let's also look at the other factor that is try to reduce the block generation interval. So the approaches are like about the con like about modifying the consensus algorithm, like using proof of stake or delegated proof of stake or, or Byzantine fault tolerance. So the benefit will be very similar. That is also try to improve the scalability while lowering the cost. But the concerns are. Uh, are not much discussed, but these are just my own opinion. One is I think it's more centralized than proof of work. So what does that mean? Uh, so for proof of work, if you don't really have any coin, you can also you can still do that. But uh, for proof of stake, if you don't have any coin, like you you have nothing. Basically, you have you you got you got no stake. You cannot you cannot build any block. So I think uh, what what proof of stake will finally have is like the people who got, got the most number of coins, basically they control everything. So that's more centralized than proof of work we got today. But for proof of work, it's also like if you control the most mining power, you can, you basically like pretty much like a centralized, uh, pretty much like a centralized node. But uh, for the other people, there is still some very low probability that you can still generate block. How does reducing the block generation interval um, affect that? Is it just that? Affects you, scalability? Um, or? Well, why does that exacerbate the difference between proof of work and proof of state? Oh, so it's not, it's not reducing block generation interval exacerbate that. It's like the proof of stake itself exacerbate that. It's like the mechanism itself exacerbate the, the centralization. But uh, but uh, but proof of stake is just a mechanism to reduce block generation interval. But block generation interval directly doesn't exacerbate that. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so if we reduce the block generation interval just in proof of work, right? So that. Uh, that leads to unstable blockchain, right? So yeah, yeah. just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people also talk about like reducing <laughs> that, but uh, because in like the ten minutes in proof of work on um, Bitcoin, like it's chosen such that you pretty much know it's gonna be roughly stable, meaning that like it's mostly it can be it can be consistent like or like it can be finalized after like six blocks, so. Yeah, it's pretty much a experience value like people choose. It's kind of interesting to see like what the minimal time interval you can choose for proof of work. It seems that Ether, Ethereum has a much smaller value, which is 10 second-ish, I remember. Yeah. So that's, it's, I mean, empirically it seems that it's very hard to further reduce the time interval 
much less than 10, 10 seconds each. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's, that's a factor that that's a function of the number of nodes mining this or not. Yeah. If anyone has any insight on that, like, feel free to speak. Okay. So a third factor is uh, some people are also trying to increase the level of concurrency. So it's pretty much like just use data partitioning or like people call it sharding in the blockchain community. So Ethereum itself proposed some sharding mechanisms. Uh, it's still in some early state, like they don't really have a working implementation yet. So what it does is instead of like Basically, basically they need to like route the route a transaction or some data to some certain nodes because only the set of nodes knows the all the history or the current the current history of the of the data. So, but uh, this definitely adds a lot of complexity to the blockchain itself. So one is about so think about if you want to perform a transaction. Uh, that require modifying data on multiple set of nodes. Like how can you make sure it's a transaction? How can you make sure it's, you can roll it back if one fails? So, so it's like, it, it definitely adds a lot of complexity to, uh, to the existing blockchain given there is a consensus algorithm. So on the other hand, like for each shard, it corresponds to fewer nodes to reach the consensus which also means it might be not as secure as the rest of the, as the main blockchain, or as the main Ethereum or main Bitcoin, because in order to, in order to attack a version of the shard, you, you can only control much, much fewer, fewer nodes than the others. So these are just like uh, security trade-offs people have to make when try to scale the blockchain. So, when we talk about all of these uh, ways to scale blockchains, we also mention like all of them can, can lower the cost. So here I want to just summarize, roughly summarize what's the, what's the relationship between scalability and the cost and compare them to uh, increasing the number of nodes. So scalability is mostly defined by throughput, that is uh, the number of transactions per second. So, and cost, pretty much defined by uh, the amount of cost you have to spend per tra to perform a transaction. So for proof of work, uh, what we can see is like the, if, if, there are, if we increase the number of miners, the throughput is not actually going to change. It's, it's about always the same, about like seven transactions per second if you don't modify any parameters. But as to the cost, if you increase the number of nodes like the Mining a transaction is m like is incurs a much much higher cost than before. The, shouldn't the uh, rate of finding the proof increase as you increase the number of nodes? Yes. So then it means that the throughput should actually increase with the number of nodes because you'll find the, the mm -hmm. you solve you will solve the puzzle faster if you have more participants who try to solve the puzzle. But, but then the difficulty level is increased. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like the difficulty level is like some, some configurable number people adjust like after some time. Yeah, basically if you have more nodes, the difficulty will be higher. So they just want to keep the, the mining time to be like a constant about 10 minutes. So that's why you can, and the, given that everything else is a constant, like the throughput is basically about like seven transactions per second for proof of work. Yeah, but uh, with, with more nodes joining, like the cost is going to be higher and higher. So, which means if you want to keep decentralization, you have to allow any node to join, but when more nodes join, like the cost will be, will be higher and higher. You know, by cost per transaction, you mean the cost of mining and not the, let's say, the transaction fees or something? Yeah, not the transaction fee. It's like the cost of keep, keep it operate. Yeah, but uh, the transaction fee would be like probably very 
it's like a in proportion to it's like in probably a linear function or something to to the actual cost if the cost is lower the transaction fee can be lower yeah but if the cost is actually very high there is no way to lower the transaction fee so so if we look at proof of stake uh, in terms of throughput it's going to be higher but uh, when we increase the number of nodes it's still going to be roughly like a constant but uh, in terms of cost I just put some random lines here I think the cost is not going to, to like it's not going to increase a lot as we increase the number of nodes but uh, it's definitely much lower than the than the proof of work mechanism and if we, if we talk about uh, Byzantine fault tolerance uh, if we increase the number of nodes, it's going to be like more messaging, like it's going to be hard to get consensus and there are many like messaging passing. So the throughput might be affected a little bit. So that's why it's decreasing a little bit. But the cost might also be increased a little bit, but it's not like a lot. So when we talk about sharding, uh, it actually can, the throughput can actually increase with the number of nodes because because you can if you if you think about like you still make the number of nodes that are required to to uh, consensus a shard a constant so you can actually just li linearly scale it the cost for sharding is per transaction is also pretty much a constant okay so there are also another uh, set of work that doesn't really try to improve any factor in this equation. So what they try to do is to directly reduce the number of required transactions so that that's how they achieve, uh, how they achieve scalability. So basically what people do is like they propose some techniques like off-chain techniques. So what these techniques do is uh, they try to move the op the actual operations off chain, but still leave some guarantees on chain, so th so that the Bitcoin or the or the Ethereum mainnet can just perform the make, making sure the guarantees are enforced, so without having to uh, perform all the operations. So uh, examples of of these off chain uh, off chain techniques. Uh, basically have like two categories. One is about like a uh, lightning network, which is proposed by the Bitcoin community. And the other is radar network, which is proposed by the Ethereum community. And there is also another work called like Plasma, which hasn't been implemented yet, uh, proposed by, by a lightning author and, uh, and an Ethereum founder. So I'll talk about these two kinds of work in the next few slides. So uh, what is a lightning network? The idea is basically like this. The two parties, uh, say Alice and Bob, tries to pay each other uh, some money. So they can, they can deposit some amount of money on chain with some mutually agreed conditions. And then after that, they can just do all the, uh, all the payments off chain. So there are two kinds of technical fundamentals involved in Lightning Network. That is, one is called like payment channel. Uh, the other is called a hashed time lock contract. Let's first talk. Uh, uh, let's first look at the payment channel. Uh, say, Alice established a payment channel to Bob. So, what does that mean? Uh, it means Alice deposits some amount of money to the blockchain and signed by both Alice and Bob. And after they also sign another uh, another transaction that is after a timeout, which can be like some days or some hash time hash hash uh, some block numbers or something, uh, and this deposit can be refunded to Alice, signed by Bob or signed by both. So, so uh, with these two transactions, what people can do is after the timeout, Alice is guaranteed to get all the money back. And before the timeout, Alice and Bob can adjust the amount of refund 
uh, off chain. So, so this this pretty much like uh, pretty much like some you 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 have some deposit and you actually can do things like in between before before the timeout. So instead of like opening a one-way payment channel, we can actually open to uh, a duplex payment channel two ways. So the hashed time lock contract is built using the payment, uh, payment channel as primitives. Say, uh, if here is an example. If Alice wants to pay Charlie $10 to buy something from Charlie, and uh, Alice and Charlie uh, doesn't have any on-chain payment channel open, but uh, they both like open a on-chain payment channel through Bob. So what they, ca they can do is like this. So first, uh, Alice, will ask, uh, Alice will ask Charlie to generate a random number, which we will call a pre-image, which is just a secret. And uh, Charlie will get a hash of the random number and send it to Alice. So then Alice will send Bob $10 but uh, which is conditioned on Bob showing this, showing this uh, pre-image. And Bob will do the same to Charlie. Say, uh, Bob will send Charlie $10 if Charlie can uh, show Bob the pre-image. So, and then Charlie can actually show the pre-image pre to Bob. At the time, Bob, Bob knows like, well, he can definitely get that because he got the pre-image so that he can actually collect the the phone from Alice, so that Bob can just uh, give the ten dollar to Charlie, and then uh, Bob will do the same: show the pre-image to Alice and uh, claim the ten dollar. So that's how a payment net network works. With uh, which we call like the the hashed time lock contract. Any questions? Which parts of this can go off chain? Oh, so like all of this are off chain except for payment channel opening. So basically what it's like is you can you can think of it like at day one you just you just open like Alice opens a payment channel with Bob and Alice deposit like a hundred dollars on chain and Bob also opens a payment channel with Charlie deposit like fifty dollars on chain. And uh, so off chain what they can do is as long as they don't go over like fifty dollars they can just do things offline. So all of these we talk about are actually off chain. Only like opening payment channel is not on chain. Is, is there some previous uh, currency that was designed? Because I, I remember reading something similar to this that you have a pre image random number generated pre image. I think it's called eCash or something. Are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> uh, at, at the end, they should do some update to the actual chain to show yeah. what the, um, the end balances are, right? Exactly, exactly. So basically what they do is pretty much like compress all the payments. They can do any payments in between as long as it doesn't go over the, the on-chain capacity they set. And at the end of the contract, like say, because when they set up the contract, there is a timeout. So before the time, the time is out, they'll just settle the funds with all these like off-chain uh, interactions. Yeah, so, so the security guarantee is like, uh, in order to be safely, for people to safely collect these $10, they have to make sure like the on-chain channel capacity is more than $10. Otherwise, like there is no guarantee you can get all of this money because you didn't set it, set it up on-chain. So what is Lightning Network? Lightning Network is pretty much like say, like in a P2P world, like people just randomly open up payment channel between each other. So the claim is like anyone can pay anyone else off chain if there exists a path between them within the available capacity. So for example, if D wants to pay Bob $5, what they can do is just like find the path through Alice and then like modify the on-chain capacity, and then they are done. So, a lot of because this is like a network, like a lot of research, like 
has been opened up to address some issues within the Lightning Network. So there are uh, some research like capacity imbalance. Uh, so for example, it, uh, so unlike traditional like data communication net network, the through like the bandwidth is some somewhat like a constant if you don't have data flowing in or out. But in in the payment network, the capacity is not a is not a constant. Like it's it's a result of you your past payments. Like sometimes you can easily go imbalanced. So uh, there is uh, there is a team of researchers propose something called revive. So what they did is like if they find a cycle of, of nodes, if they can just like make a payment like through the cycle, which, which has zero effect to, to all of them, they can make the capacity more balanced. So that's one research work has been done. And uh, there is a second kind of research work that is, uh, that is like reducing the locked liquidity into the network. Say here, if, uh, if we consider the payment between D and Bob, so there are actually two, you have to lock the $5 at least uh, two times because you go through Alice. Like both uh, D and Alice have to, have to lock the $5 in order to get it sent. But uh, sometimes in a larger network, probably if it has like six hops, you actually have to lock six times the actual amount to get something sent. So that is, definitely not, not good. So what people propose is also uh, something called Sprite that can, uh, that can make this like a synchronized message so that you don't really have to lock that much money to, to, uh, to the, to the on-chain. And there are also some people talking about the routing algorithms in the network. So like traditionally people talk about how we can uh, uh, traditionally, in data communication network, people, when, when people do routing, people mostly care about reachability, like they have to find the path from one to the other. But uh, in payment network, in addition to find the path, you still have to find a path or multiple paths with enough capacity. So that's some additional cha challenge uh, imposed in payment network. So there are also some open questions on Lightning Network. Uh, I read through a blog that actually blames Lightning Network is not going to work. So his argument is basically Lightning Network will definitely lead to centralization. So why is that? Because if you look at this uh, topology, to uh, in order for these seven nodes to uh, send payment with each other, it actually opens up like one, two, three, five. Uh, it opens up uh, eight edges, but uh, but if you if you just allow like any node to uh, set up payment network with each other, you can actually uh, at most like open up like n square uh, payment channel, which is definitely not going to scale. But if you want it to be scaled, the easiest way is just like to uh, to have a network architecture like a star. Basically, you have a really big like. Uh, Big, uh, really big node, which handles the, all the messages to the other to the other nodes, so that uh, you can uh, you can minimize the uh, you can minimize the number of hops from one node to the other, which is always two. You can also uh, like it's pretty much like the most performance one, but uh, uh, the most performant one. But uh, but in this case, you have a very big node which is pretty much like the payment network is centralized. How does the topology of network form? It's by the decentralized protocol organization. Yeah, so currently no one, no one actually talked about how the, how the network topology would be like. People just assume like pretty much like Bitcoin, you can set up any network topology you want. But uh, definitely the way you set it up will affect the, the performance of the payment network a lot. The way that each, what, uh, each client or each node can choose uh, whatever node he wants to connect, uh, he want, he want, want to connect. Yes. Yeah, currently like no work has ever talked about that. I guess I'm confused about this. What does it mean that Bob and D are connected? 
or connecting means like uh, D can send uh, payments to Bob offline. Okay. I mean, they're all on the same chain, right? Is there any reason that they, is the offlineness what makes them not connected here? They're connected in the online sense? Yeah, so, so it's like uh, online, it's like D and Alice, uh, for, for all the ed edges listed here, it's like they both open up some payment cha channel online. So meaning they deposit some money and then claim, after a timeout, they can claim the money back. So after that is set up, like, it, like anyone can exchange money to anyone else. So here it means like, uh, like the, the, the numbers on a link means like the, the amount of capacity like one can send to the other off chain. Okay, so uh, one issue is like Lightning Network might lead to centralization, but uh, today it's unknown because there is no, there is no like network topology or anything on that. So it's unknown. And uh, the second issue with Lightning Network is the locked liquidity is very unfriendly to today's economics. So today's e economics most, mostly like is on a credit system, but uh, if it requires to lock up a lot of liquidity into the network, like who is going to lock their funds into the network in order to provide something they might or might not do in the future? Say if I want to buy something from Amazon, I actually have to lock an amount uh, larger than the amount of money I will spend in the network, uh, which is really uh, unintuitive. And uh, if for a node, so like in the middle, like it's also unclear like why like the node needs to lock a large amount of money in the network. And also if you, if you think about if there is a central node that relays all the payment, payments between one and another, like it actually needs to lock all the funds, like a very, very large amount of funds into, into the network, which is really weird. I suspect that in a setting like this, we would see um, credit agencies arise in the network that offer you to um, borrow some money, for example, up yeah. to your credit limit, right? That yeah. They approve you for some amount of money, and then uh, you pay them some fee to lock more money than you presently have. Um, <coughs> or maybe it'll be just like the credit card system today, and you get some reward for using that credit agency. Um, but yeah, it seems like uh, that would just naturally arise here because uh, people don't have access to credit anyway. Yeah, like even if they have like access, like like today's like like the bank system is like, uh, if bank sa says like they are able to loan like ten million in total, they actually only have about like two million uh, cash in the in the bank. So it's it's not really like a one to one mapping today. But uh, for the lightning network for it to uh, for it to provide a security guarantee you actually have to have all the cash available for the amount of money you set so it's like you either have to have to like impair the 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 system like the security part or you have to it's like some trade off one has to make but uh, but for the bank but for bank it's like people usually trust the bank so that they would like to Actually, even if the bank doesn't have all the money, like they still like can trust the bank to like to uh, basically if, if they claim they have like ten million, like you 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 usually would believe that. But for Lightning Network, because these nodes are like they don't the nodes themselves don't really have trust, so it's like very hard to very hard to convert it to that system. Yeah, and I don't really know if there is any work today that is trying to address this issue. Okay. So there is also uh, another big piece of work called Plasma that is uh, very different to the kind of work Lightning, Lightning does. So what they do is instead of asking, uh, asking the participants to set up some uh, to deposit money uh, on chain, what they do is like uh, they ask 
users and uh, chain, some other chain operators to agree, some, agree on some terms. And after that, the, the chain operators has to deposit some money on the parent chain uh, in case it violates the term. So after that is, uh, that is set up, uh, the users can just work with the child chains all the time without, uh, without contacting the, the parent chain unless there is any violation of agreement. So it's pretty much work uh, very similar to Lightning, but, uh, but the difference is like, uh, uh, the difference is like they, first of all, like the on-chain, uh, the on-chain contract doesn't really, it's not really about like just money and some conditions, it's about uh, enforcement of some terms, like, like uh, smart contract and some uh, penalty that uh, one party would like to pay if they don't if they don't uh, if they violate the, uh, if they violate the terms so so what is the plasma child chain here so basically uh, it's also it's also a fully functional blockchain uh, it provides all the functionalities as the parent chain but uh, the only difference is it's operated by a smaller set of nodes so that provides better scale or scalability. And uh, based on that, the child chains can also recursively acting as someone else's parent chain. So you can think of it as like a big tree, like the Ethereum, like for example, can be the, the, the root uh, blockchain. And uh, Ethereum can have some like child chains that talk into Ethereum directly. But uh, the child chains can also uh, talk to their child chains directly, so this way like People imagine like the whole blockchain system can scale. Uh, so uh, the Plasma work has no implementation today. Uh, it's still like under development, development and, and uh, discussions. So there are some issues we identify uh, early on Plasma. So one issue is when is a transaction con considered final in this way? Say you are actually interacting with a uh, a grandchild of Ethereum, and then after you finish your operation, when can you consider the the transaction is final? Because when the when a grand grandchild is not doing something good, you can probably go to uh, the grandchild the grandchild's parent to ask him for a refund. But uh, if the if the if the child chain is not doing good, you can still ask for Ethereum to get a refund, but uh, to, in order to identify, in order to say a transaction is final, like you actually uh, have to recursively going back to, to the chain to actually claim the, the fund. So it's, it's, it's a little bit unclear like when a transaction is considered final. And the second is, uh, is the recursive feature of that really, is really useful? Like I, I don't really know because uh, no one has, has ever used it. So, because it has not a working implementation. So I think there might be some other issues, but uh, these are the issues like I, I identified uh, about Plasma. Okay, I, I think that's uh, basically about all of my presentation today. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, thank you. So is it fair to say that Plasma is a sharding approach to, from the summary that you put out before? Yes, I think it naturally shards like the, the stuff into different blockchains, child blockchains. And then in your background researching this, did you see, do people have a concept of like uh, a minimum size that a shard could go? So I could imagine that once you get down to, there's only one miner per shard or something like that, that it's not very useful, right? So is anyone talking about like how how leafy the tree of plasma could be? I think it's still in its very early stage, so it's like still haven't gone through all the details yet. Yeah. I had a I was thinking more about the I think at the beginning when you said the block generation time and we decided that if it's less than 10 minutes for proof of work, then the blockchain becomes unstable. And how is, how is Ethereum able to use proof of work? Because 
does it have a faster block generation time? Uh, can you say the letter part again? Yeah, um, I don't know if my my assumptions in this are right or not, but uh, how would I think we said that um, with a block generation time shorter than ten minutes, then the proof of work in Ethereum and Bitcoin would be unstable. So I'm wondering how Ethereum is able to to use proof of work with a I think a faster block generation time. Yeah, that's a very good question. I haven't <laughs> thought about. I haven't thought about like how Ethereum can be different from Bitcoin, but uh, but uh, I know like how EOS achieved this. Like basically, EOS is another kind of public blockchain because its consensus algorithm is different. So it, they are not using proof of work, but using some delegated like proof of stake. So in that case, basically the the, the number of nodes to uh, in order to require to get a consensus is much fewer than than. Bitcoin. So I don't know if that's something like for the block interval, like for Ethereum's block interval smaller than Bitcoin's, probably it's probably something similar. I don't know. I think there's, yes, there's, there's something to do with the difficulty level of the puzzles, how they exactly, how they exactly said that. If my, I'm not sure whether the truth, but my assumption would be uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, di di Bitcoin uh, blockchain's difficulty on the puzzles will be actually higher than higher than than Ethereum. But but why is it higher? Why why Ethereum can be lower? And I still be stable. Yeah, I cannot find a theoretical justification. On how to Maybe they pay less money for <coughs> mining. No, I, I, okay. So I think the comment about. Uh, 10 minutes being a good number for the chain to be stable mm -hmm. could be an upper bound because so when Bitcoin protocol itself was introduced, it started with the assumption that we want the network to be stable. So I'm going to put this 10 minute bound on the network. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum evolved later, like was designed after that. So uh, yeah, maybe that stability threshold is a little, lot lesser than the 10 minutes is what I would, uh, but I don't have a very good explanation of why it is stable. So that may be the conservative approach? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's how I would think of it. Well, I heard like Ethereum's like, puzzle is easier. Yeah, they're geared to more like five or ten seconds. It makes sense that it would be easier. I was just wondering whether that yeah. causes instability. <laughs> it seems like maybe is the answer. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like a. There's oh. a one. Oh, okay. so I think there is a one, another. Metrics we haven't talked about here a lot in just the latency, right? Mm -hmm. So the ten minutes, it's actually a huge penalty on the latency. Like sometimes you actually you want the latency to be less as well. Think of uh, confirming a transaction. If you want the six confirmation, it takes one hour. If you only, even if you only want like a half of the three confirmation, it takes half half an hour. That's that's actually pretty bad thing from the user back perspective. Any more questions or comments? Maybe online? Did, did, did yeah, I asked, but I know he didn't reply anything. Sorry? He didn't reply anything. So. Okay, so no question. Okay, then let, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> okay, so we have another external speaker, Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming by.